Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon of the Chabad House of Delmar, together with my co-host Mark Vronich of Statewide News Service, jbiztechphilly.com, and now columnist for the Jewish Press. And I'm uh, very busy doing all of that, and uh, I talk about how government relates to the Jewish community and doesn't, as the case may be, when I write my column for the Jewish Press called Albany Beat. So uh, with us today is uh, one of the finest assemblymen in the uh, in the, in the State Assembly, in the People's House, Assemblyman David Weprin from Queens. Welcome back to The Jewish View. Always a pleasure, uh, Mark and Rabbi. So good to see you. Um, you know, one of the issues that has come up has been uh, anti-Semitism on the, on the CUNY campuses, City University of New York. Uh, what, what, how involved have you had some CUNY schools in your district, I think? I do. I have uh, Queensborough Community College, and uh, I'm on the edge of uh, Queens College and uh, York College as well. So uh, how involved or how focused and how are you following this? And well, uh, absolutely. There have been a number of um, you know, anti-Semitic incidents and there's uh, an organization that's funded uh, by uh, CUNY as a organi student organization called Justice for Palestine, uh, which basically has been promoting uh, uh, harassing uh, pro-Israel students and Jewish students uh, and have really um, gone over the line, so to speak, uh, of anti-Semitic incidents and uh, also rhetoric uh, making it very uncomfortable uh, for Jewish students. I'm, I'm a very strong advocate uh, of free speech, mm -hmm. of uh, the First Amendment. But at one point, uh, you go beyond the First Amendment when you're actually harassing students uh, and actually even in engaging in, in physical uh, fights yeah. uh, and also spreading uh, lies and comparing uh, Israel to Nazi Germany, uh, to the Nazis and, and other horrific uh, type of accusations, and um, Assemblyman, this, I'm going to make news tonight, because Assemblyman Duff Hyken and I are releasing a letter tomorrow morning uh, to the uh, CUNY Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Milliken, uh, basically asking him to uh, stop funding uh, this organization, Justice for Palestine, uh, and to basically uh, not recognize them as an official uh, student organization. Okay, so their so banner uh, organization is Students for Justice in Palestine? Students for Justice in Palestine, right. correct. So how are you, uh, w you know, how do you think this will be received, uh, you know, by the CUNY Chancellor? I mean, he, well, the CUNY Chancellor has already Jew said... Is he Jewish? Uh, he is not. Oh, okay. But uh, the CUNY <laughs> Chancellor uh, has mentioned uh, that he, um, you know, intends to investigate uh, these incidents. Uh, I would hope that uh, he goes beyond investigation if he finds certainly the uh, investigation to, uh, to warrant, uh, you know, that there has been uh, crossing of the line of uh, free speech and harassing students and making it very difficult uh, for pro-Israel or, or Jewish students to uh, do their daily routine on the campuses uh, that he should suspend this organization immediately. Yeah, and do they get uh, funding from a student association or anything? Yes, my understanding is they get funded like other student organizations, so which is uh, through, through dues that are paid, but it's, uh, it's under the auspices uh, of the City University of New York. Mm. So that's a big problem right there. Uh, what have you known, so, so you've known this group to be going out and harassing, I mean, that it's not, it's this group in particular, not individuals. Correct. Okay. It's, it's this, this particular uh, student organization. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, individuals can, you know, do, uh, you know, what they do, and obviously if they uh, involve in, uh, you know, intimidation yeah. and, uh, and bullying yeah. in, uh, in physical uh, harassment or, or even verbal harassment, there are other sanctions uh, that a CUNY can take on individuals. But here we're talking about a, an officially sanctioned uh, student organization, so uh, I don't think it should be something that uh, that CUNY is sanctioning. No, uh, absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm glad you and the You're on top of it. It's great. Uh, have yeah. put this letter forward. That's very. Uh, you know, it's just important for yeah. the Jewish community very to get an advocate. Sometimes you have. Uh, there's enough Jewish politicians. <laughs> maybe there should be more. But in any case, that to stick up for the Jewish people, they they have all kinds of issues that they're standing up for, but yourself and Dov Heiken, you know, standing up for what's important to the Jewish people. Mm. Correct. And we're actually going to have, um, I don't have the final number, but they're going to be uh, well over 20 or 30 uh, members of both houses of the legislature signing this letter. Oh, wow. really? That's yeah. right. Of, of all religions, ethnic backgrounds, etc. Sure. It's, I mean, it goes beyond uh, one particular religion or one particular ethnicity. 
Uh, no one wants to see this type of uh, action uh, for anyone, whether any, you know, I mean, because a lot of other groups have been harassed and have been bullied, and you know, the, there's got to be a stop to it. So this Correct. is great. So I'm glad you're taking the lead on this. Congratulations. Very nice. Excellent. So we've got good news here. Yeah, yeah. That's it. No, good, good news, news or bad news, news, right? It's like, um, so you also had a, um, a major piece of legislation passed, major for you, a uh, piece of legislation passed in the Assembly recently, too. Yeah, well, actually passed <laughs> last session. Uh, it's on the floor right now, uh, and we expect to pass it right after the budget. But it would basically uh, allow adoptees uh, for the first time uh, to have access to their original birth certificate. And of course, from a, a Jewish halachic point of view, uh, that is a very important piece of legislation because uh, it will enable a very uh, a number of uh, or most uh, adoptees to have access to their original birth parents' uh, name and religion uh, on the birth certificate. One of the items that's put on the birth certificate are the parents' names uh, and their religion. And, so it wouldn't uh, the, be redacted in any way. There's nothing that would be redacted. Well, uh, this is. Um, a compromise bill from the original bill, but uh, if the um, birth mother uh, does not object to uh, releasing uh, her own name, uh, it won't be redacted. If the birth mother objects to her name being disclosed, uh, then the other information can be disclosed, including uh, religion uh, or place of birth, etc. So that's the mother's, and uh, what about the father? Uh, the father as well. Oh, okay. it, it would be up to both parents. Uh, but from a halachic point of view, we care about the, uh, mother. the mother. Well, well because it, it, yeah. goes, it, it goes to the point where we always knew Whether who the someone's mother Jewish, was, right. not, not necessarily who the father was. <laughs> anyway. Well, right. other, there's <laughs> another point to it also, not even halachic. Of course, that's very important to Jewish, but just the idea of the medical records. You know, you go into the doctor, and then they ask you, well, what did your mother die of? What did your father die of? Or, you know, what is their disease? So, and that's half their medical history. I mean, that's, you know, what they are. And if certain people don't even know what it is, sometimes it gets a sticky issue. You oh, know, absolutely. Your parents have that? If you have a medical emergency, uh, you, Hasella comes uh, and you, uh, you go to the hospital or you go, you know, to the emergency room, first question so the uh, personnel in the emergency room will ask is, do you have a medical history of uh, heart disease, do you have a medical history of cancer, uh, you know, what is your mm -hmm. medical history, and diabetes. as the rabbi point, diabetes, mm -hmm. as the rabbi pointed out, if you don't know who your biological parents are, uh, you have no way of knowing what their medical history and is. You, and then you're subjected to more tests uh, to rule out certain things. Correct. As opposed to ruling something in, and that's unnecessary medical care. Um, the other thing I wanted to... Uh, ask you, oh, who's the Senate sponsor? The Senate is Senator Andrew Lanza, who is a Republican okay. uh, state senator from Staten, from Staten Island. So that's a good thing. And he's hoping to pass it uh, this year in the Senate. You got, he's got some commitment for that? I mean, well, uh, you know, it, it ain't over till it's over, as uh, yeah. uh, the late Yogi Berra used to say. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, well, we're optimistic that it'll pass in the Senate this and year. And what about in the Assembly? How many sponsors do you have on the bill? Oh, we had um, uh, over, over 76 sponsors. Over, so you yeah. can get it out of committee. Cause well, I, it's already on the floor, but well, it'll... But it, I know that, yeah. you know, Carl Hastie said that, uh, you know, he needs at least a majority of the conference. Yeah, well, we have over 76 Democrats at this point. We have uh, <laughs> probably... Um, Closer to 100 overall sponsors because we have Republican sponsors as well. Okay. Well, yeah, this is I, I in my column on the Jewish Press I said, you know, when does 76 not become a majority of 150 <laughs> when right. the assembly does the counting? <laughs> so that's my. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, you're a big uh, proponent for mayoral control of the city schools. Well, I don't know if I'm a big proponent. Well, I you think have they're certainly sponsoring the bill. I, right? I'm, I'm supporting <coughs> uh, mayoral control extension, but with the caveat that I think there should be changes uh, in the current law, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to make those changes uh, when we extend mayoral control. Uh, for example, under the old school board system, before we had mayor, mayoral control, uh, parents uh, and the public uh, had had more access to the system. They would have regular monthly meetings. Uh, parents or, uh, or teachers or just regular uh, citizens from the community uh, could testify on a regular basis about what they saw problems in the system, etc. Uh, that layer was kind of eliminated with mayoral control. 
So I'd like to see that layer put back. Not, I'm not suggesting bringing back the old school boards where there's some problems in some areas. Mm -hmm. In the area that I represent, for the most part, there weren't those problems, but there are other problems in other parts of the city. Okay. Uh, but at the very least, there should be uh, access uh, to parents uh, and to community and civic leaders uh, to have access uh, to input uh, in the process. You're going to be busy the last half of the session. Uh, Absolutely. As soon as we do the budget, I think that's one of the items that's uh, outstanding yeah. and we're going to be dealing with. Uh, you have an issue that's close to my heart that you're sponsoring a bill, which is cameras in the courtroom. Yes. Uh, a news tell man. us what the uh, potential of that. Uh, well, we, st we thought we had some momentum a couple of years ago. Well, when to start with, what is the law now? You know, well, start from the beginning because you can't have cameras? The law is now that, um, that you're not allowed to have cameras uh, in the courtroom, so that's why we have sketch artists. So there are sketch artists there, you know, doing sketches, etc. Even but the, if everybody agrees, you know, let's bring in the cameras, right, it the still wouldn't be allowed? You could petition the judge, and then the judge can ask the plaintiff and the defendant whether they want it. Uh, well, there was actually um, a program that my father had sponsored and my brother uh, after him, which was an experimental program which was in effect for a number of years in New York State. That program expired. Right. Um, that allowed uh, for cameras in the courtroom all the time unless uh, the litigants and the judge uh, d did not want it. Right. So there was a, a provision to not have it. Um, but if, if the litigants uh, you know, consented at this point, it still wouldn't be allowed under New York State law. Uh, and the Court of Appeals is the only place where there's, uh, the state's highest court is the only place where cameras are in the courtroom. Uh, I don't know if they, uh, they're in the courtroom under, under all their proceedings. Is that the case? Yeah. Okay. Well, then we're talking about trial courts. Then. Right. Exactly. Not appellate courts. Right. Um, and the sketch artists are not always so good with their sketches. Uh, I was sitting through Shelley Silver's uh, trial and, you know, they were terrible. <laughs> they made him out to look real bad and he could have. You know. well, I guess it would depend on the newspaper, uh, what too. Would no, the well, law, uh, what would be the new law, though? What were you proposing for the new law, that if the, everybody agrees there can be cameras? No, no, no. There, um, there would be allowed cameras, period, it would, yeah. at an experimental basis, unless the judge felt uh, it wasn't in the interest of justice to allow it in this particular case. But there would be that exception. But other than that, it wouldn't be up to the litigants. It would be up to right. uh, you know, the judge whether or not to allow it. And, okay, now you have a bill that I'm a little confused about because uh, it, it's different from a bill that you had either last year or the year before. Uh, the Religious Garb Act was the earlier version, but then you have a new title that, which says prohibits discrimination against religious attire and opportunities there too, including facial hair. No, that's the same bill. It's, oh, it's the same bill. It hasn't changed. But it says provides, uh, wait a minute. This, it's the same uh, bill, it hasn't changed. Provide, but the, the, the title is right, it provides discrimination against religious attire. Yeah, but it and, also would include facial hair. And it has two different bill numbers, so this might have been from a different session? Uh, probably from a different session, but that okay. bill already passed this session. The, the, the new oh. bill uh, passed this session. It's the same as the old bill, okay. it's just uh, a 2016 uh, bill. Oh, so it passed, it passed this session. It did pass. And it passed like the first couple of weeks of session. What's going on in the Senate with this? Well, uh, it has a Democratic sponsor in the Senate, uh, James Sanders, oh. uh, and he hasn't been able to get it out. But, uh, Why don't you get uh, Simcha Felder to sponsor? <laughs> well, we, we've got a. You tried? You didn't want to? Or? Well, no, we. Uh, we it was Sanders logical uh. what have uh, but Sanders uh, yeah. represents Richmond Hill which I represent yeah. uh, and um, it's, it's a very important bill to the Sikh community yeah. because of beards and turbans and discrimination and they've been trying to get a NYPD police officer so he grabbed the bill and once he had it uh, it was hard to uh, take it take it away from him <laughs> but, okay. uh, well you know success is success and you know how that's played so you know I would think I would I was just asking. <laughs> okay. Um, now, on your, the committee assignments. Yes. That's changed for you. You, uh, you, were, uh, you, you uh, got appointed to Ways and Means, but you dropped insurance. Correct. And that's a step up because Ways and Means is like, wow. I mean, that's the big Yeah, yeah. Ways and Means. And I also chaired the Finance Committee when I was in the City Council for eight years. Yeah. So, uh, you know. How many years do you have in the Assembly now? I uh, have assembly? Um, a little over six years. This is my seventh session now in my seventh budget. Uh, so. Oh, you're a numbers guy, without a doubt. I mean, you know, you 
were brought into the Mario Cuomo administration and the banking and all Deputy that Superintendent of Banking, yeah. and I chaired the Finance Committee of the City Council for right. eight years. So, so this uh, is, you know, ways and means. And I sat you. through almost all the budget hearings mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> participated uh, during the budget process early on yeah. when we had our preliminary budget hearings. Yeah, yeah, no, I, you, this is perfect for you, you know, but, you know, and then you drop the insurance committee because you only have so much time to do so many things, so. But all your other committees stayed the same, banks, cities, codes, election law, and, and judiciary. judiciary. Correct, mm -hmm. but I also chair an assembly task force on people with disabilities. That's right. I had that before, and um, Speaker Hasty appointed me uh, last year um, secretary to the uh, Democratic Conference, so that's a leadership position as well. Wow, that's terrific. Okay, so you're, you're in there with the new speaker. He thinks very highly of you based on all of this. So, I mean, actions speak louder than words, so. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Um, I would uh, ask why are you a member of the Puerto Rican Hispanic Task Force, but that seems obvious because your district has a lot of Hispanic. And no, not really. It's, no. Uh, <laughs> it's not so much that. My mother uh, was born in Cuba. Oh, so uh, my mother's a Cuban Jew, and uh, so I'm half Cuban. <laughs> so uh, on that basis, uh, I was eligible to, uh, to eligible. join the caucus. But you don't have a member of the Jewish Legislators Association on here. Uh, that is true. I am a member of the Jewish Legislative yeah. Association. I, I could Should put that, that. Uh, on my uh, stationery. I asked other uh, Jewish members why they put this down and they don't put that down. And, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, I should do that, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, I could do that, yes. <laughs> you know, okay. Um, didn't want to think I'm picking on you. You know, I ask everyone the same thing. Uh, all right, anyway, so then you have this uh, bill that relates to crime of staging a motor vehicle accident. Correct. What, what happened? We is passed that an insurance uh, thing? Is that, yeah, uh, it's, it's basically, <coughs> um, it goes back to a, a constituent of mine, Alice Ross, uh, who uh, was Oops. 71 years old, a, a grandmother in uh, Belrose, uh, Queens, uh, and uh, she was killed as a result of a, a phony staged uh, motor, mobile, uh, motor vehicle accident uh, for insurance fraud purposes. Uh, and um, what happened was, it was this accident, she, sw she went around to avoid the accident, or the potential accident, uh, and she crashed into a tree and was killed. Oh. So um, she, the um, perpetrators can be prosecuted uh, for insurance fraud, but they, and they also can be uh, prosecuted um, for um, you know, manslaughter potentially, mm -hmm. but the actual act of staging uh, a phony motor vehicle accident is not a felony under New York State law. This so this would actually make it a, a felony. It would make it easier for district attorneys uh, to prosecute uh, these type of crimes. In the case of resulting in a death, uh, obviously uh, you, can, you can go after them for that. But what if it was just an accident uh, and no one was killed or no one was mm -hmm. hurt? Mm -hmm. uh, they cannot be prosecuted for that uh, as a felony. Right. Uh, maybe as a misdemeanor and therefore it makes it easy to perpetrate these type of insurance fraud which in the end costs everybody in, uh, in insurance premiums. Yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely. So this is called Alice's Law. Correct. So where does this stand then? Well, interestingly enough, uh, it passed almost unanimously in the Assembly. Uh, a different version passed almost unanimously in the Senate that Senator uh, James Seward, who heads up the Insurance Committee, uh, is sponsoring, and we're still trying to resolve the, uh, the differences uh, in the bills. And you hope that, I'm hoping that, that this you know, session will do it. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, that's good. Uh, then you have uh, provides increased penalties in education for hazing, underage drinking, and drug use within athletic teams, fraternities, and sororities at college campuses. Yeah, that actually Any resulted of experience. Uh, yeah, there was a constituent of mine too in no, Oakland Gardens. I meant personal experience. Not personal no, okay. experience. <laughs> no. I did go to SUNY Albany, but I did not belong to a fraternity. Okay. Um, but uh, although I did live on Colonial Quad my first right. year, which is where all the fraternity was, uh, right. no, because that was where the kosher kitchen was. In Colonial? Oh, no, it was in no, Dutch. Dutch. It was oh, in Dutch. Dutch. Yeah, yeah, it was on Dutch, you're right. Because I lived on Colonial. I got assigned first. to Colonial, but yeah. then I, you're right. Yeah. I, the kosher kitchen was on Dutch, yeah. So, okay, continue with your other story about. So there was um, a constituent of mine, <laughs> uh, uh, Michael Deng, who, um, uh, Chinese American family, and uh, he was involved in this uh, Chinese fraternity, uh, and uh, he uh, died as a result of this hazing incident, uh, where they were asking him to, uh, you know, lug, uh, you know, uh, blindfolded, uh, lug, uh, you know, 
heavy uh, material, uh, you know, while he was outside in the snow, and uh, it ended up resulting uh, in his death. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, it, it didn't happen in New York State, it happened in Pennsylvania, but you may have read about the incident, uh, mm -hmm. and as a result, we're trying to, uh, you know, make uh, physical contact itself uh, in a hazing incident, uh, you know, a separate uh, crime. Well, you know, there was a case at University of Albany in Indian Lake where there was a uh, power line going underneath the lake that some physics students had reported to the campus, and the campus didn't really do anything about it. They, they found elevated electricity levels in the lake, these students. And there was a fraternity who was doing a voluntary hazing it wasn't mandatory, and there was a student who went into the lake and hit the open power line. It was electrocuted. electrocuted. And the school had to pay a lot of money to the family, but just a lost, you know, a bright Can't replace uh, yeah, your life. So the of the student. I'm just saying the that there's, a, in case you need this uh, person, this other story for you, bolster your uh, bill, I'm here to help. Yeah. <laughs> the other, Thank you. <laughs> the other thing is, um, you have a bill that include that says uh, bias related graffiti should be treated as a hate crime. Yes. What what what? How did this germinate? What did you? Well, there, you know, been a number <coughs> of uh, of incidents. Uh, Swastika is, of course, uh, very much of a concern to our community, and uh, you know, devastating uh, Holocaust victims uh, and others uh, that are affected by that. But it's not just, uh, no, it's the you know, gay community. They have, uh, it's, uh, yeah. I have a, a large Asian, South Asian population. I have mm -hmm. a large Muslim population as well, uh, mostly from Bangladesh. And, uh, you know, there have been a number of uh, hate uh, graffiti uh, in those cases. And uh, it's not just vandalism. It sh and should not be treated as vandalism. Right. It should be treated as, as a hate crime. Which would be a felony? Which would make it a felony, yes. Right, right now it's a misdemeanor. It's like a violation, you know. But it should be treated more seriously. Yeah, it should definitely be differentiated between artistic graffiti mm -hmm. uh, and graffiti that has a hate message, uh, you know, which, which is what we're trying you to know, get and at. That's kind of subjective because now these gangs write things in code that are meaningful within their gang, but the average person might not know, might not have any meaning to it when they see it. So. Well, that's true, but that any crime is, is, is a question of the yeah. facts and, and right. is subjective uh, and that's to, a have to a judge and, and jury as well, yeah. <laughs> so that's why we have courts, okay. Um, and where is that bill now? Uh, that bill is uh, in, in the codes committee. Um, okay. So it's, uh, we, it, those bills end up, uh, you know, um, goes down to the wire uh, every session. Is but there a Senate sponsor for that? Um, yeah, that particular bill, bill has uh, Senator Kevin Parker from Brooklyn sponsoring okay. it, but he actually had it passed in the Senate last year. Wow. So it passed in the Senate, and uh, he's optimistic it's going to pass again in the, in the Senate, but it's tied up in the Codes Committee, and part of the argument of the Codes Committee is that uh, they don't want to create additional crimes. Uh, they tend to, you know, think we, uh, we have too many, uh, enough felonies now, and uh, I think we have to stress to them mm -hmm. uh, that this is, is, is important uh, to many, many communities because we have to really uh, stress upon young people in particular uh, the seriousness uh, of hate graffiti. It's not and, just uh, vandalism. And the fact that you're on that com the codes committee and you have a seat at the table, you can certainly, uh, you personally make You know, the case. I think that's important because it's interesting because in Europe, and we know that there's so much like there's hate in between communities and I just say, and I always think back, and I'm like, listen, America. I mean, there are groups, and like I'm saying, I'm saying they're not nothing. They they have uh, people like that, but it's not as open as in Europe. And I'm thinking, why? And maybe it's just really because there's so much legislation, because there are laws against that, which means, I mean, people without I mean, fear of the law. Hey, it's just not right. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just besides the felony part of it, think, hey, we're taking this seriously, and you just can't get away with it. So I. I don't know about how you feel about that, but that's what I always was thinking, why in America, you know, we don't have these kind of hate issues as Europe, for example, which is a Western civilization, you know, that's not as bad as they have it there. But I think it's kudos to you oh. that you put it to the forefront and saying, hey, it's not going to be tolerated here and we're not going to allow it. Yeah, I do have a package of disability bills uh, that we're going to take up uh, on Disability Awareness Day. There is uh, a particular day that the assembly uh, has set aside 
uh, for disability awareness uh, bills, and uh, we have about uh, five or six of those bills I expect to pass uh, on that day. I, I believe it's May 16th, okay. but don't hold me to it. But it'll be published. Uh, it's online mm -hmm. in the Assembly, and it's a Disability Awareness Day when we hope to pass an entire uh, disability package, okay. uh, which would include actually um, a number of bills that haven't passed in the Senate, but we've passed in the Assembly the last couple of years uh, about providing for evacuation uh, from apartment buildings uh, and, uh, you know, a list of people with disabilities uh, to, uh, published to the landlord uh, and uh, provisions to, uh, to make sure that they're notified uh, in the case of an emergency to, uh, to be evacuated. Help them be evacuated. You mean if they, because if they say they don't go by assistance. the, yeah, you can't go by the elevators, it says if there's a fire, don't go by the elevator. So what are, now what well, are you going to do if you're in a wheelchair? Well, also people with disabilities have special needs and they need special attention. And if you have that list, uh, they will get to th those apartments, uh, you know, right away, as opposed to, uh, I have a quick not. question to ask you about, yes. uh, Preet Bahara. Yes. Uh, he was in Albany and he criticized the legislature for being enablers for what happened with uh, someone who was speak former Speaker Silver. Uh, do you feel you were an enabler? Do you take exception to what Preet Bahara said? Uh, I do take exception and I think uh, uh, Preet Bharara is very naive in a lot of ways because he thinks, you know, that uh, there's all this blatant corruption up here, but you know, um, I've been around the legislative process in Albany uh, going back to uh, my father's days, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. the 70s, 80s, 90s. I, I was a college student up here in the 70s. Uh, and I would say 99% of my colleagues, you know, are hardworking, honest people. Uh, there are always a few bad apples, but it, it's certainly less prevalent uh, in our industry uh, than it is in, in, in private business and in other places. But I don't see Pre Parara targeting uh, industries, which uh, certainly uh, you know could be targeted for you know illegal acts, corruption, mm -hmm. etc. But I, I don't think it's something that's inherent in the legislative process or in Albany. It's not like there's something in the in the air or in or the, the water, water. <laughs> uh, you know that uh, gets people to uh, do uh, illegal acts, basically. Because really, basically, we're talking you know about illegal acts in the case of. Uh, former Speaker Sheldon Silver, I think in some ways they kind of changed the rules in the middle of the game. Uh, you know, legislature is part-time. I know we're talking about uh, possibly making it full-time, possibly limiting outside income, but all the years that Speaker Silver was there, uh, we did not have those rules in place. Uh, we don't get paid uh, for a New York City legislator getting paid 79500 uh, for a full-time job is very hard to uh, to support your family to bring right. up a family and, and if you're an Orthodox Jew you, yeah. you send your kids to yeshiva and uh, and have other expenses mm -hmm. specifically kosher food is very expensive yeah, to the Orthodox yeah. Jewish community so uh, that's why you know I'm not a, a proponent of eliminating outside income altogether uh, but certainly if they were going to limit outside income it should be tied to a major salary increase because uh, the state legislature hasn't gotten a, a basic salary increase in uh, over 16 what would years. Would you like to see it go up? To? Well, I'm not going to use the number, although well, the city council, yeah. uh, it's it raised there. At they salary, just went up to, uh, I think, one, 148,000? Or 180 or something? No, 148. Yeah, okay. I think it was 148. Yeah. I, it should definitely be, you know, well over 100,000. Yeah, and hopefully, and no, and no outside income. Then. Or limit, the very limited very outside limited. income. Okay. You know, the people that uh, teach or do other things, lawyers. Are you in favor of a constitutional convention? Uh, I am not, uh, because um, I'm not sure that a, uh, when you have a, open up a constitutional convention, there's a lot of things that can happen, uh, you know, in certain proposals and certain extremist groups can have uh, an undue influence uh, in that process. We have a process now. Uh, you can introduce a bill uh, to change the Constitution, and uh, all it has to do is pass two successive legislatures and go on the ballot, and it's up to the voters to decide. Well, we saw that with the electronic voting, or the, the, uh, uh, what do you go, the iPads or whatever that you have on your desk now, right. and, and you, uh, you have less paper, so that you know, a bill can age on the computer, and not necessarily in print, you know, physically in print. Yeah, and I'm afraid in the case of a constitutional convention, you're gonna have a, a number of insiders uh, you know, who are basically gonna deprive the public of having that input in a constitutional uh, change. 
uh, I think it should go up to the voters when you're talking about a change to the Constitution, mm -hmm. and that wouldn't take place if we had a constitutional convention. Anything else you want to mention? Uh, no, no, just that uh, we hope to have a budget uh, in the next day or two. Uh, I think then it has uh, to age. We've had five years. No, well, I think you're going to get message of necessities then, because then an uh, abuse of a message of necessity. Is well, it's not, I don't think it's an abuse at all. I think it's a provision that uh, is in the law. The governor has that uh, authority. The governor is very concerned about having a sixth on-time budget. And uh, I, I'll do another prediction tonight, another, uh, yeah. you know. Um, we'll start with that, we'll end with one. Yeah, yeah uh, another um, news uh, yeah. right off the press. Uh, we will have a message of necessities, uh, and I, I'm pretty convinced we'll have a budget uh, in place uh, by Thursday night at midnight or, or thereabouts. Okay, thanks I Thank that. you very much. You've been a good legislator for New York State and an advocate for the Jewish people. So continue with success and with good health. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Mark.